Is there any type of video game more difficult to discuss critically than Dating Sims? A game that's designed primarily to allow the player to fall in love with fictional characters is naturally going to revolve around personal wish fulfillment, and may be revealing of the traits that a person may desire in a romantic or sexual partner. That's even more personally intimate than how someone feels in a game with branching narratives based on the player's moral or philosophical convictions. And it can also be much harder to talk about publicly because you can't fully separate those feelings from yourself. Dating sims also present a more straightforward challenge to discussion when they include sexually explicit content, as many of them do. That opens up a whole other can of worms with regard to what's appropriate to explore in a place like, for example, YouTube. How much do you have to censor? How much does that detract from the overall experience? And most of all, is there really any purpose to talking about games when you can't show off the one thing that we all know is the main reason that they exist? Fortunately for you all, however, I am as shameless as they come, and as a gay French New Orleanian, I scoff at such prudish prohibitions on the discussion of sex. Feel free to combine every stereotype you've heard of pertaining to New Orleans, the French, and gay men to back up that statement. For Pride this year, I wanted to step outside my usual coverage of Nintendo series and tactical JRPGs to shine a spotlight on some examples of a genre that I also enjoy very much, but that almost never gets any broader recognition, especially when it comes to gay dating sims. There is, of course, one major exception to this rule, and it's quite possibly the reason you clicked on this video. I will indeed be covering Dream Daddy, Although, I'm saving it for last because I'm going to be making points when discussing the other three games I've selected that will lead into my thoughts on Dream Daddy. So, hopefully you'll stick around and not just skip to that part of the video, or otherwise you might get a little bit lost. Do note that when I say gay dating sim in this video, I'm referring to those games where both the main characters and their love interests are all male. There are dating sims out there with a more mixed range of queer content, as well as some that focus exclusively on queer women, but I feel less equipped to discuss those in depth, so I prefer to leave those to people who can offer more insightful commentary on that kind of material. Additionally, while several of the games that appear in this video are sexually explicit, there will be no explicit imagery nor any discussion of sexual content beyond acknowledging in broad strokes that it exists. My channel is so small that I don't even have to make a joke here about being demonetized, but even without the threat of losing out on ad revenue, I'll do my best to be as tame as possible in talking about these games. Up to a point. More on that later. But first... Leading off with what is unquestionably the horniest game in this video, Full Service asks us to consider the lives of the staff at a massage parlor that offers happy endings, you know the ones I mean, and learn that these men have day jobs and aspirations and desire to be valued for more than just their boundless enthusiasm for intimate massage. Overworked banker Tomaki scores an invitation to the spa of the game's title, and over the course of weekly sessions he comes to bond with the colorful group of masseurs at Full Service getting to know them outside of work, and gradually coming to the realization that the spa may not be entirely on the up and up. Surprise, surprise. Full Service, by developer Herculion, stands out from many other gay dating sims not just for its polish, although there's quite a bit of praise to be made there, but in a depth of gameplay that you rarely see in this sort of title. There's a degree of resource management, with the love interest having heart levels that you can increase by giving them gifts or responding favorably in dialogue options, like a Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley kind of thing. Each heart level increase corresponds to a heart event, a date of sorts where Tomaki builds his personal connection with one of the guys. There's also a limited calendar system. During the week, Tomaki will work at his serious banking job, and then spend the afternoons and evenings hanging out with the other guys, while on the weekends he goes to the spa or hangs out with the staff at special events, which serve as the themed set pieces that many dating sims offer. There's a beach day, a formal party, a costume night for various flavors of light roleplay, that kind of thing. These two elements, the heart levels and the weekend events, operate semi-independently from one another, 
and full service doesn't lock you into pursuing a single love interest until the very end of the story, which allows, and arguably even encourages you, to date some or even all of the guys at the same time. It's actually impossible to complete a full run of the game and only have sex with one person. That's a kind of sex positivity that I don't often see in dating sims, and I can respect it. Just as I can also respect the honesty with which Full Service handles the fact that most of its main cast could be described as sex workers based on their duties at the spa. Speaking from my own experience when I'm not making YouTube videos and blogging about fandom stuff, sex work is a varied and multifaceted profession with its challenges and its rewards like any other, and Full Service never demeans its masseur or prevents them from expressing professional pride at their ability to satisfy their customers. Many of the love interest's personal stories further highlight this theme. Casual hookups come easily with friends and clients alike to Covet, but he's never had a serious relationship before, and so he struggles to engage with Tomaki without immediately making it about sex. Remy is a model when he's not working at the spa, and the fake relationships he has to maintain with his female co-workers for the sake of the tabloids, as well as the growing pressure to do more adult photo shoots, constrain his ability to come to terms with his bisexuality. Rald is Tomaki's straight-faced boss at the bank who uses his work at full service as an escape from the pressures of his regular job and his domineering father. It's stories like these that really stretch the game's slightly ridiculous premise to its limit. And the same can be said for full service's overarching plot, which attempts to tackle a very serious real-world issue. No big spoilers, although it's nothing too shocking for a story revolving around a massage parlor that advertises extra services. But how well the game manages this particular subject is more up for debate. It doesn't come directly into play until late in your first run, and later runs include additional scenes that flesh out the mystery and the major supporting cast, including the game's main villain who gets an interesting alternative ending if you can figure out how to unlock it. That secret ending comes in addition to the nearly 20 endings associated with the seven main love interests, and all that extra story content only adds to Full Service's several dozen sex scenes and hundreds of CGs. If you're browsing these games on Steam later and cost is a factor, Full Service unquestionably offers you the biggest bang for your buck, uh, pun intended. There's an awful lot of that, too, as you'd expect from a title with a setting named Morningwood, and an elephant mascot character that parodies gotcha mechanics. Don't worry, though, gotcha doesn't force you to pay actual money to throw yourself at the mercy of the RNG. I like that Full Service knows when to be serious, but also when to go all in on the obvious lowbrow humor. It understands what kind of game it is. What I like a bit less, though this may come off as nitpicking, is the voice acting. Most of Full Service is not fully voiced, instead relying on a selection of one-liners for each character that get tied to relevant dialogue boxes. That part's fine, usually doesn't add much to the experience, but it's there. But that goes out the window when you unlock the character's perfect endings, which are fully voiced. The performances here range from passable to pretty good. However, it's not only these romantic confession scenes that are fully voiced, it's also the sex scenes that follow, and, well, I imagine that voicing sex scenes is not so different from voicing fight scenes, and that it's a lot of non-verbal grunts and other sounds mixed in with thickly emotional one-liners. It's easy to accept that with fight scenes, because it's generally understood that combat in fiction is more of a dramatic spectacle than it typically is in reality. But that same suspension of disbelief doesn't quite carry over to sex scenes, which are supposed to be you know, erotic. It's not intentional. We're not talking like that college humor sketch of Gilbert Godfrey reading Fifty Shades of Grey here. But even the best voice actors can only do so much, and the vocals can sometimes be more of a mood killer than anything else. At least there's always the option to turn off the voice acting if it ever gets to be too much. As befits its concept, Full Service is pretty good at allowing you to tailor your experience to suit your needs. Happy endings and all. As much as visual novels allow you to explore new experiences while mostly avoiding the separate need to provide gameplay that clicks with you personally, there's something to be said for indulging in the familiar as well. 
Chessa Blade scratches that particular itch for me, with a pseudo-early modern European setting and general aesthetic in line with what you'd see in a Fire Emblem game. It's never an on-the-nose direct reference, but it's close enough to where I could describe this game as Fire Emblem if it dropped the combat and RPG elements and went full dating sim. And also, the main characters were all gay guys and their world is just okay with them hooking up because reasons. Historical realism it's not, but I can live with that. Chess of Blades is an older project by Argent Games, the developer behind Dead Man's Rest, which I talked about back in April. While this is a bigger budget affair in more ways than one, in essence, the games are rather similar. Neither relies on dating or romance as its primary focus, instead establishing an external conflict that the protagonist and his love interest of choice must confront together in order to reach their happy ending. For Chess of Blades, this conflict takes shape over a five-day festival for nobles and diplomats, Decadent frivolity and light-hearted meet-cutes rapidly descending into conspiracy and genuine danger as the characters are thrust into solving one of several crimes before they can become full-on international incidents. The plotting of Chess of Blades reminds me of some Agatha Christie mysteries, with a small cast of characters trapped in an isolated location with an unknown criminal on the loose. Everyone's a suspect, including the love interest in some cases, and it's up to you to steer main character Rivian Varison away from the game's various death endings and into the arms of the Fire Emblem character archetype of his choice. The devoted knight, the incorrigible flirt, the defrosting asshole, or the gruff red-headed mercenary named Saber. Okay, that one is a little too on the nose. I see what you did there, Argent Games. But really, Chessa Blades is a little unusual in that its protagonist is arguably just as much of a full-fledged character as any of the love interests. Rivian can be a hard character to like at times. He's antisocial, he's frequently rude, and his snark misses as often as it hits, and I still can't quite tell if that's deliberate or not. The plot of the game is just as dependent on Rivian getting over himself and figuring out what he wants to do with his life, as it is with the development of each of the love interests. And while that may detract from the self-insert fantasy aspect of Chess of Blades, I found it a refreshing change of pace. As with Dead Man's Rest, it's easier to write a plot-driven visual novel where the main character isn't scripted to be as featureless as possible, where they can react to situations in ways that align with their personalities, and where their interactions with other characters are informed by their history together and an even back-and-forth dynamic. I fully admit that I might be a little biased in his favor, because Rivian's lack of a certain kind of versatility, shall we say, compared to a protagonist like Tomaki, happens to align with my own preferences. Even so, that in itself works as a character trait, so what you might lose in projection there, you gain an understanding of how Rivian sees his role in sexual relationships. What's more, despite a much smaller number of sex scenes compared to some other titles and the aforementioned, uh, positioning issue, Chessa Blades freely plays with a number of inventive bedroom activities, each of them matching quite well Rivian's relationship with his quartet, or should I say quintet, of possible partners. Unfortunately, though, Chessa Blades also comes with a more severe case of the voice acting issues that plague full service. The entire game is fully voiced, and although I have to get points for ambition, the overall effect is perhaps less than what might be desired. Many of the voice actors affect posh accents for their roles, presumably to make the characters seem more noble and refined, but sadly, very few of them manage to sound natural when doing so. Rivian himself is a notable offender, and it's telling that he sounds his best in more emotional scenes where the actor has to drop the accent somewhat. Then there's Saber, who's in a class of his own as far as questionable voice acting choices go. I may be a hypocrite to complain about substandard audio quality, but there's something very off about the volume modulation with this character. Saber's lines are all either so quiet that he trails off at the end of sentences, or so loud that I can't recommend watching any scene with him while wearing headphones for the sake of your eardrums. You can toggle some of the characters' voice acting off individually in the options, but unfortunately Saber isn't one of those. It's a shame, too, because there are some actors here who put in some solid performances, 
sometimes even with the posh affectation, but they're buried beneath a fair amount of mediocrity. I will say, though, that Chesablade's original soundtrack is absolutely fantastic, and whether you'll prefer it or full service in that regard will come down to personal taste. Music isn't something that people tend to pay much attention to when talking about visual novels, but props to both of these games for really putting in the extra effort. Now, it's not my express intention today to say that any one of these dating sims is unequivocally better than the others. From this overview, you've likely gotten the impression that Chess of Blades is rougher around the edges in comparison to the other titles I'm discussing, whether that's from the artwork, or the situation with the voice acting, or even simply the smaller number of love interests, but I hope that's not the main takeaway here. There's still a lot of talent and ambition on display here, and I wanted to call attention to a game that seems to recognize that there's a market for dating sims inspired by a big-name tactical franchise that itself has been taking significant cues from dating sims for a decade. Plus, the deft way in which Chess of Blades handles its protagonist and his relationships with the men in his life puts into perspective just how hollow Fire Emblem's self-insert same-sex romances really are, even if they're attached to a much bigger franchise. Fire Emblem's queer content thrives in subtext that skirts around censorship and potentially homophobic demographics. It can leave the sweeping on-screen romances, and the hardcore gay sex, to games that don't have to worry about carrying the Nintendo seal of approval. Released in 2014, Obscurisoft's Coming Out on Top is by a good margin the oldest dating sim featured in this video. It was also more or less my introduction to the genre, and even almost eight years later it still impresses me with how well it holds up. Aside from the consistently clean artwork, there are almost no frills here. It's just a story of a young man in his last semester at university who comes out to his roommates and dives headfirst into the exciting and frequently horny world of gay dating. There's some light gameplay elements that contribute to some of the endings, and whether or not aggressively bland English major Mark Matthews will actually graduate. But apart from those, coming out on top looks and feels like a straightforward slice of life feature. At least at first, anyway. Even for an eight-year-old game, coming out on top is fully aware of the inherent absurdities of the dating sim genre, and it pokes fun at that awareness using techniques that have been further popularized by later titles. There's a lot of fourth wall breaking humor, there are references to erotic fanfiction, there are silly and unexpected death endings, and there's even a thoroughly demented secret love interest that I won't spoil here, although I will note that this game predates The Shape of Water by three years. Just throwing that out there. That oddball energy balances rather well with the game's nondescript premise and setting, and while Mark is a less developed protagonist than Rivian or even Tomaki, his love interests do a fairly good job overall of carrying the emotional heft of their roots. Phil's an uptight military guy who's secretly a huge nerd. Brad struggles with an overbearing brother and the pressure of a football scholarship in a way that speaks to how American universities overinflate the value of their athletics programs. Alex is Mark's anatomy teacher, and his route flirts with the forbidden fruit of teacher-student sex while never allowing Mark to actually commit to it if he wants to really date the guy. Jed's always down for casual hookups, but what he's really looking for is a boyfriend who'll trust and support his artistic ambitions. Mark's allegedly straight roommate Ian turns out to be not quite so straight as advertised, but he's got some issues to work out that might not be quite what you're expecting. Combine all this with some significant variation in how certain scenes play out and a limited degree of customization for Mark and his love interests that allows you to decide how hairy they are, and coming out on top offers a surprising range of romantic and erotic options even given the mundane restrictions of its setup. What's more, you can tell that the development team got comfortable expressing more creative scenarios in future content updates. This is most evident with the BroFinder dates, which use an in-universe gay hookup app to send Mark on one of nine short dates of varying levels of zaniness. He can have a nerdy conversation about The Legend of Zelda while trapped in an elevator, sample some unusually raunchy gelato, 
or get help from a pair of highly unprofessional paramedics after he gets high and shoves his pet goldfish in a certain intimate location. Sure, not all of them are winners, but there's also the occasional bit that feels a little dated. Like how I'm pretty sure one of Brofinder's only twink options is meant to be a reference to either a younger Justin Bieber or one of those guys from One Direction. But there's still a lot to love here too. Including a handful of scenarios that I can't explain in detail, but that are incredibly relatable as someone who spent quite a bit of time on hookup apps. Then there's Amos, the only full love interest added in an update. Amos can be a breath of fresh air among the other dating options, especially if you're starting to get a little tired of how almost all the men in these games are muscular 20-somethings. His route blends the quirkiness of most of the Brofinder dates with the sort of gently romantic outings you'd expect of a middle-aged sugar daddy. He takes Mark on a hot air balloon ride, to a showing of breakfast at Tiffany's, and to a poetry slam where he and his ex insult each other by trading quotes by Walt Whitman and John Keats. It can be a little jarring, admittedly, that the man who meets Mark by defending him in a bar kicks off the route where a foul-mouthed parody of Microsoft's Clippy coaches you through writing your own poem, but for better or worse, Amos' route is by far the most experimental part of coming out on top, and that's not even touching on the erotic wrestling segment. The experiments range from utterly off-the-wall silliness that I couldn't explain adequately even if I didn't have to worry about censorship, to genuine cruelty leading into the game's most mean-spirited bad ending. It's a lot to process, and while the dialogue options that get you to this route's four different outcomes are heavily telegraphed, Amos' story does suffer somewhat for all its odd tangents. Even so, however, he does acquit himself as well as the other love interest in his best ending, which caps out coming out on top's plethora of sweet and sexy storylines and plays out like the ideal bear daddy romance. One might even say that Amos is a dream daddy. Finally, we come to the one most of you have probably been waiting for, the big fish in the small pond that is gay dating sims. Dream Daddy, developed by YouTube's Game Grumps, is frequently heralded for its wholesome and lighthearted approach to queer representation and its accessibility for players who may not be familiar with the genre. Ever since its release in 2017, it's been the biggest name in gay dating sims and arguably the closest thing to a true mainstream dating sim, period. Once you set aside games with dating sim elements like Stardew Valley and Fire Emblem, and also Doki Doki Literature Club, which is only pretending to be a dating sim. Dream Daddy even got a Switch port, imagine that. With all that acclaim, it may surprise you then to learn that until I started working on this video, I had never played Dream Daddy before. Something about this game just seemed off to me, as if, despite appearances, it really wasn't designed with someone like me in mind. I did get around to playing it and finishing all the routes last month, and, well, there's a lot to unpack here. First, though, let's get into some terminology. When queer men call someone a daddy, it's the approximate equivalent of calling a woman a cougar. That is, it's an affectionate and frequently erotic term for a person past a certain age, typically 40 plus. As is also the case with cougars, daddies are often identified as well by their preference for significantly younger sexual partners. Setting aside the mutually erotic element, as well as the additional complication of sugar daddies, there's a psychological underpinning to these types of relationships that should be pretty easy to understand simply based on the knowledge that they're called daddies. Daddy is a term of endearment, a source of pride, a self-identifier on hookup apps, and a porn tag. And while, as with most labels used by queer people, the exact meaning is fluid and can vary based on context, it's generally understood that a man doesn't have to be a literal father to be a daddy. Gay fathers certainly exist, but they're less common in large part because openly gay men are less constrained by the heteronormative pressure to marry and have children. This is the main reason that I led into this segment with a discussion of Amos's route from coming out on top, because his romance with Mark is a great example of what queer men would understand a daddy relationship to look like. Amos appears to be in his 40s and has 15 to 20 years on the main character, 
and in their time together, he broadens Mark's cultural and sexual horizons in a pseudo-paternal mentorship. There are other, similar dynamics in the games I've talked about, like between Mark and Alex, or between Tomaki and Rald, and this speaks to how unremarkable these kinds of relationships are among queer men. Although, it doesn't take much poking around on the internet to discover that not everyone feels the same way. I have neither the time nor the patience to get into that contentious topic, but suffice it to say that it's somewhat understandable that a game wishing to reach as broad an audience as possible would be less concerned about accurately representing what a gay daddy actually is, when doing so might make some people uncomfortable. In fact, Dream Daddy takes everything I just said about the label in its title and chucks it right out the window. You take on the role of a customizable self-insert, a dad Sona, if you will, who, along with his teenage daughter Amanda, moves across town to a cul-de-sac coincidentally filled with other single fathers. Once you've introduced yourself to the neighborhood, Amanda gets you on Dad Book, where you quickly bond with all the other dads and learn that all of them may be looking for more than just friendship. Now, incredible story contrivances aside, Dream Daddy's premise runs primarily on dad jokes. That is, jokes that are intentionally not funny but become ironically funny, in theory, if it's acknowledged that they're not funny. If this sounds stupid, that's because it is. The writing of Dream Daddy is so dripping in irony that it can never really take itself seriously, which as you might expect prevents it from ever addressing some of its subject matter with the weight that it deserves. Most obviously this could be said for the characters' sexualities, which are never addressed in any way beyond basic acknowledgments of the genders of past and potential future partners. Although the dad book interactions are described as dates, the majority feel distinctly platonic but for a line here and there in the script indicating that the dad Sona finds something cute or attractive about their companion. This often comes off as a rather amateur way to convey romantic chemistry, and in a broader context it makes it harder to believe that some of the dads are genuinely into guys when nothing about their characters indicates that beyond the obligatory third date romance with the dad Sona. Craig was married to a woman and is hit on by other women multiple times in his route, Matt is still grieving over the death of his wife and spends his entire route coming to terms with that, and Brian's route doesn't parse as romantic at all until their daughters literally force them to have some alone time, and their insecure need to constantly one-up each other spontaneously transforms into cuddling. Dream Daddy, of course, is also the only game featured in this video to not include explicit sex scenes, but that's really not an excuse. Dead Man's Rest lacks explicit scenes as well, but it gives its characters space to talk about their attraction to men and the challenges that come with forming and maintaining those relationships in the face of criminalization and social stigma. It's genuinely a little concerning that a game set in the 1870s has a larger vocabulary for discussing its character sexualities than one set in the 21st century. Or, for that matter, let's look at Chess of Blades itself, which never delves into individual sexuality either, but also hand waves the entire situation with a few lines of dialogue establishing that men romancing each other is considered acceptable in this society. That's also low effort writing, but for one thing it stands out less because it's low effort world building rather than low effort romantic chemistry. And for another, it shows that the writers understood that a story in a pseudo early modern historical setting would require some kind of explanation for why its protagonist can be publicly wooed by other men without repercussions. Dream Daddy doesn't have such a restrictive setting, but on the gay dating front, the writing never does anything with that, likely because that might get too heavy. Its tone issues don't stop there, either. Probably the most routinely criticized dad is Joseph, a youth minister who is also the only love interest who is still currently married and whose dates culminate in an adulterous fling aboard his yacht. Never at any point in his route does Joseph touch on the subject of how his faith intersects with his apparent bisexuality, which feels like quite a missed opportunity for meaningful discussion. Part of the problem is that Joseph's specific denomination is never identified beyond the Bibles on his bookshelf skewing Protestant, which actually matters as the teachings of even mainline conservative Christian denominations can differ on topics like homosexuality. Instead, Joseph is just a cool, waspy youth minister with a rocky marriage and hazy Jimmy Buffett-inspired fever dreams, 
and when he turns down the dad Sona in his good ending, it's because he doesn't want to get divorced or keep cheating on his wife, and not for any particular religious reasons. Or what about Damien, who's confirmed to be trans in a single line of dialogue in his first date where he mentions wearing binders? At no other point does this ever come up in conversation or get explored in any more detail, even when it's later revealed that Damien is a boring IT guy when he's not a Victorian cosplayer. Much like the character's sexualities and several of the romances with the dad Sona, Damien's gender identity feels tacked on. Contrast this with Thara, the receptionist at the spa in full service whom the developers have described as either genderqueer or a trans woman. Thara's backstory details her journey of self-discovery through her work at the spa and her relationships with men, including how she became more confident in herself as a woman when she got a boyfriend who affirmed and supported her both in and out of bed. As someone who's occasionally operated in the gray space between feminization kink and trans identity, Thara's story is pretty relatable. And it's all the more remarkable because she's not a love interest, she's a side character. The writing did not have to develop her this much, or even have a trans woman in this role, and yet Thara and the relationship she formed with Hisame are central to the game's big plot twist. Damien being trans, on the other hand, never impacts anything. Not his relationship with his son, or the dad Sona, or anything else. And most you could suggest that the way Damien's route handles his Victorian interest is a metaphor for learning how to be more comfortable with his real self, but the game never suggests a connection between the two. And besides, this is not a subject that a game like Dream Daddy should have to dance around with metaphors, especially when it's clearly trying to be praised for its queer representation. You get now why I covered those other games before I got to Dream Daddy, because it's difficult to look at this game and not think of another title that more effectively manages the same or similar material. You want references to other video games? Chess Ablaze has an entire route scripted to end in a courtroom drama that doubles as a shout-out to the Ace Attorney series. And unlike the Pokémon-style daughter brag-off battle with Brian, the reference makes sense in-universe. You want the option to hook up on the first date? Coming out on top has several love interests to allow you to get some early satisfaction, and unlike Robert, only some of them lock you out of those characters' good endings. Did my earlier spiel about gay daddies make you uncomfortable, but you wish that Dream Daddy had actually engaged with that topic? One of the Brofinder dates is, as it happens, a literal father who gets weirded out when guys hit on him by calling him daddy. And if Mark wants a successful date, he'll have to navigate that discomfort and give Donovan the space to be both a father and a lover. So, yeah, I am kinda saying that coming out on top did Dream Daddy's basic premise first, and did it better. Indeed, once you move past the Dad Dating Simulator subtitle, you start to notice that Dream Daddy suffers from a muddled vision of the kind of content that it wants to offer. There's an assortment of basic minigames that range from just sort of there to deeply frustrating, there's a cameo by a Canadian indie rock band. There's of course the creative input, vocal talents, and general branding of the Game Grumps and their collaborators. There's a non-canon horror-themed cult ending buried in the game's code. And here or there, the writing does explore some genuinely engaging themes, namely the struggles of being a parent and the realization that when you settle down and have kids, you're no longer as young and free as you used to be. Neither of those themes are unique to queer men, nor are, as previously mentioned, the most broadly relevant to our experiences, but at the risk of further beating a dead horse, not much about Dream Daddy feels like it's trying to be relevant to queer men. It's just using the gay dating sim thing as a gloss for its many disjointed creative concepts. So why then does that gloss exist in the first place? Obviously, I can't say for certain, and I'm not familiar enough with the Game Grumps to make any conjectures based on their body of work, but in my cynicism, I can hazard some guesses. At the start of this video, I pointed out that dating sims are a hard type of game to talk about with other people, both because they center around personal wish fulfillment and because many of them have explicit sexual components that would have to be omitted on many platforms. Dream Daddy, by contrast, avoids both of these issues, it lacks sex scenes, of course, but even its intimate moments are rather tame and never go beyond brief kissing and cuddling, and the game's idea of spicy pinups as rewards for getting the dad's good endings is shirtless men. Wow. Oh, except Damien, now I wonder why that could be. 
On top of the lack of need for censorship, Dream Daddy is also quite easy to feature online, whether that's in showing off the dad Sona you spent 15 minutes customizing, or screenshotting the small handful of romantic dialogue boxes, or praising that one line about Damien being trans, or coming up with extensive headcanons about the dads romancing each other instead of the dad Sona, because I'm not the only person who thinks that flat self-inserts kind of suck, or developing the game's extensive supporting cast. The unusually small options menu for Dream Daddy even includes a streamer safe mode, meaning that this game was created with YouTube and Twitch in mind. Now, that's the more charitable interpretation for why Dream Daddy is the way it is, that it was carefully designed to be as social media and advertiser friendly as possible, and is thus the dating sim equivalent of a corporate sponsored pride parade float, in that it looks pretty and has a big brand name attached to it, but most people understand it to be a transparent cash grab. The less charitable interpretation would be that the development team had a variety of ideas they wanted to explore in a visual novel and thought that their project would stand out more if they made it gay. Even though the subject matter isn't especially well suited to a gay dating sim, and even though there's a faint sentiment on display of discomfort with the sexual element of male queerness, and hesitance to explore potentially controversial topics in any real depth. To frame it another way, on Tumblr and Twitter you'll sometimes come across the line of thought that Yaoi, in this context media made primarily by women centering male same-sex relationships, exploits and objectifies queer men. This is a fairly inane thread of discourse that I don't care to get into here, but as a queer man I feel more exploited by a game like Dream Daddy. I can respect horniness in writers and artists because that's a genuine source of creativity and I can fully understand why some women would find male same-sex relationships appealing. I respect a lot less a game that willfully misunderstands an aspect of gay culture and caters to a social media-based flavor of respectability politics more than it caters to the interests of the kinds of people it depicts, and that further, despite its relentless mediocrity, is held up as a paragon of the genre and a landmark of representation when it only looks that way if you've never played any other gay dating sim. To be fair, I doubt there was any intentional malice here, and you could read Hugo's third date as a bit of self-awareness on the part of the writers. In it, Hugo jokes about the knowing inauthenticity of professional wrestlers, and then his favorite wrestler is defeated in the ring by an opponent named Corporate Shill. That's pretty on point for what this game can so often feel like. If you like Dream Daddy and have been patiently putting up with me trashing it for however many minutes, that's perfectly fine, but I'd ask you to check out some other dating sims and see if they pique your interest. It could be one of the ones I highlighted in this video, or any number of other titles. There's a plethora of gay dating sims out there, including many I've never gotten around to playing myself. There's a slice-of-life college story that actually delves into its character sexualities. There's monster fucking with alien pheromones. There's twinks at summer camp. There's a superhero one for all you MCU enthusiasts. There's even furries. There are so many options out there beyond Dream Daddy, and it's a real disservice to act as though that's where the genre starts and ends. An experience doesn't need to be wholesome and family-friendly to be a good one. Channel some of that coming out on top energy. To hell with the children. Fly that penis kite. Enjoy some Dubcon. Get freaky with it. I'm not gonna judge you. Well, that was my not-so-little rant on the state of gay dating sims. Do you have a favorite dating sim? What do you like about it, and what makes a dating sim stand out to you? Are you interested in checking out any of the games I've been talking about? I've linked all their Steam pages in the description if you want to look into them. I'd appreciate your likes and comments, and if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. My content's likely to swerve back toward Fire Emblem for the time being on account of the new Warrior spin-off, but there's nothing stopping me from revisiting dating sims sometime in the future. Thank you all so much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons and to my subscribers and followers who get invested in my content and motivate me to try new things. Have a happy, decadent pride, everyone. Au revoir.